The Canadian expat as an organization has from day one spoken about the value that the 2.8 million strong Canadian expat community represents to Canada. Now there's a book supporting our view and without a doubt this book is the most comprehensive account of what the community of Canadian expats can mean to Canada and to Canada's prosperity. Cannot recommend it enough. John Stackhouse, a nationally best-selling author, has served as Senior Vice President in the Office of the CEO at Royal Bank of Canada. Previously, he was Editor-in-Chief of the Globe and Mail and Editor of Report on Business. He is a leading voice on the future of Canada, and his new book, Planet Canada, How Our Expats Are Shaping the World, just went on sale on October 6th. We had the pleasure of obtaining the book pre-release, and not only has our amazing content creator and writer Nadia Yangin written a book review, we are joined today by John Stackhouse, author of Planet Canada. John, welcome to the Canadian Expat. Thanks for having me. This is uh, such a delight. Looking forward to the conversation. John, when did you first become interested in the relationship that Canada has with its expats? It, it probably goes back, Alan, to my days as a foreign correspondent for the Globe and Mail in what was very much another era in the 1990s. And uh, I lived in New Delhi for close to eight years, traveled all over Asia and Africa. And uh, like you, probably most uh, expats listening, I've always fascinated with bumping into the most interesting Canadians in the most unlikely of places. Uh, of course, you'd find them in you know, London and uh, New York, but uh, you know, in Kinshasa, uh, now uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, find them you know, trading uh, resources or running a finance company. Uh, and I thought that's something I didn't really appreciate about my country, that we populated um, every corner of the world in our small, humble Canadian way. And then I got more interested in the issues when I moved back to Canada uh, through the 2000s, post 9-11, the world became more skeptical of citizenship and uh, the global citizen. And I uh, started to notice a bit of a, b both uh, 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 an attack, if I can put it that way, by certain quarters against uh, people who had left the country and were seen as convenience store Canadians. I quote someone in the book as describing them as, and I thought, they're not convenience store Canadians. These are, I mean, sure, there's going to be some carpetbaggers, uh, as you'll find in, in Canada, in every corner of the country. By and large, these are people who are do, do doing a tremendous, uh, bringing a tremendous value to, to Canada's value in the world. We need them more than they need us. And the deeper I dug into the issues, the more I, I, I was surprised to learn how active other countries were with their diasporas or diasporas, depending on your pronunciation. And here we were slighting ours or, or uh, at best ignoring them. And as we shrink as a country in terms of our, our relative size and power and uh, value in the global economy. It's not a criticism of Canada, it's just basic math. Other parts of the world are growing. We need this population. Uh, they're a strategic asset to us. So that, uh, that led me to, to, uh, to the book. You know, the book is absolutely full of quotes and examples that I'm going to be using from now on whenever I get an opportunity. You know, statements like when the architect Lisa Bates says, we go to see the world, not to tell the world what to do, or we don't take, we add. Or when Brenda Trinodin, referring to the global financial market, says, people trust us more. There are a lot of such quotes that you've collected, but of all those in the book, do you have a favorite? Uh, what a great, great question. And I, I'm so glad you uh, picked up on both Lisa and Brenda because they, they, they are exemplary Canadians and really personify the, the, the global Canadian. There are people like Jim Cameron, the movie director, and Mark Carney uh, in the book, uh, celebrated Canadians and lots of them. Um, but I really fell in love with, um, I, I don't want to call them ordinary Canadians because they're extraordinary in everything they're doing uh, out there on the world stage, but not household names here. And uh, I, uh, I, I learned so much from them and found them inspiring. And those people like Lisa and 
Brenda are the kinds of people we need out in the world representing us in different ways, uh, succeeding on their own, but also taking, uh, taking, the, country, uh, taking the country with us. Um, a couple of expats uh, who really um, captivated my imagination would be Rafer Wallace, who is uh, an architect in Shanghai. Rafer graduated, grew up in small town Quebec on the South Shore, uh, graduated in architecture uh, from McGill, had wanderlust in him because his parents were travelers. And it's funny, I discovered that it's a, it's a, it's a bit inherited. Uh, ex expats often come from parents who also were vagabonds or wanderers, uh, and they've, they've got a bit of footloose uh, in their uh, footlooseness in their feet, if I can put it that way. But Rafer certainly had that and uh, got on the first plane he could, uh, wanted to be in the fastest growing part of the world. And uh, in the year 2000, that was Shanghai. Uh, and he landed in Shanghai, didn't know really anything other than what he had learned in uh, architecture school, and of course, was picked up by an architecture firm and given you know, a community to build. <laughs> and uh, they said, you're Canadian. You must know how to make good buildings. <laughs> and he kind of tells that with a laugh now, but it's, it, 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 it exemplifies the goodwill that we have uh, in, in, in the world, and that gets us... Uh, through doors and into conversations. And we have to take advantage of that. This is uh, a, a, it, it's something we've inherited. It's been built up by generations. But each of us who goes out in the world has to take advantage of that and in return, kind of pay it back to Canada. And we have to be open to, hey, you're out there, Alan, or whoever uh, it is doing something. Help, help, uh, you know, help, uh, we need to help you pay it back to, to, the, uh, to the country. But you asked, you know, was there a favorite uh, line? And of course, there are, are, are many. But among them would be something Dominic Barton, who's now ambassador to uh, China for us, uh, said to me well before he gained that appointment where he was, uh, when he was at McKinsey as global managing partner. And he said he lived abroad 25 years in London, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Seoul, uh, worked in every corner of the world. And he said, whenever I'm in a meeting, I usually can tell who the Canadian is because they are the person who asks questions and listens to the answers. And I thought, wow, that's a pretty good description for any country that we should be thankful for, that we're the people who ask questions and listen to the answers. You mentioned this, of course, in the book, but the Canadian expat community is so diverse in terms of the types of people who go abroad, the reasons why they go, of course, where they go and how long they stay abroad. But you say that the notion of a collective will is not only convenient, it's essential. It's what gives a diaspora purpose. What will it take for the Canadian expat community to develop that collective will? It, it, it's a great question because it's not a homogenous population. It never will be. I think it was uh, Chamath uh, Pulapatia, who's uh, a really interesting Canadian, uh, grew up um, uh, you know, in a refugee family in Ottawa, graduated from Waterloo Engineering, was one of the first early executives at Facebook, made his fortune there and is now a, um, a very successful venture capital, uh, social venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. And Chamath said, he, you know, in a way, expats are misfits. He goes, we left because we didn't fit in. Uh, and I don't think that's universally true, but I think it speaks to a lot of expats. In a way, to leave home, that's a tough decision. I mean, you know that. It's, uh, you're, you're leaving your community, your family, your friends. Um, your, your, Canada's comfortable. Uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful country and a very hard country to leave. So anyone who chooses to leave um, must have good reasons. They, they are probably excellent at what they do and want to be on the world stage uh, in whatever that is, but they may also want to be a bit uncomfortable. They're willing to leave the comforts of home. So when you have a population of people like that, you can't expect them to be homogenous, <laughs> uh, two million misfits, vagabonds, rebels, whatever they are. Um, they're going to go their own way and do their own thing. So we, we can't expect them to be a, uh, a, a simple uh, collective. Uh, but we can help bring them together, which I, I argue in the book, uh, most of the expats I met really, really want us as a country to do. We've got to start, first of all, by recognizing it by saying, hey, we have this, I call it our 11th province. Two to three million 
Canadians living, working and studying outside of this country. Uh, they are as valuable to us as a collective as any of the other 10 provinces. We need to respect, honor them and demand of them uh, certain things as we might of, uh, of, uh, of people who are on Canadian soil. So recognizing them, uh, dealing with them on a respectful level, not just sending them an invitation to a Canada, Canada Day party or you know, when the governor general is in town, rounding them up for a, a photo op or a, or a celebration. That's all, all well and good, but making them part of our collective decision making in the world. So I've suggested creating a unit um, at Rideau Hall under the governor general, I mean, taking it away from politics, but making it uh, part of the, the, the government in a way. Uh, and having an official status. Uh, some countries even give them representation in parliament. I think that may be a little much for, uh, for us as Canadians, but giving them that kind of status and recognition. Bringing them back, I've suggested, you know, having a council of maybe a couple of hundred uh, Canadians who can come back every couple of years for a, a gathering at Rideau Hall, not just a party, but uh, to talk about um, national issues from a global perspective and have Canadians in each part of the world maybe select uh, you know, the Canadians in Brazil can send a representative, uh, a bit like the United Nations, to sit down with not just the governor general, but uh, leaders of government, ministers, bureaucrats, corporate leaders, academic leaders, scientists. So what are, what are the big issues that we need to come to grips with as a country? And what do you, as our 11th province, who have your privy to, to decisions, to trends, to challenges all over the world, what... What do we need to be thinking about? Advise us, um, and then not a token bit of advice, but you know, challenge challenge us. I, I, I think that would be a very exciting and kind of disruptive approach to government, and for Canadians around the world, what a what a, whether it's that channel or others, what a great opportunity to say, you know, if you carry that wonderful little blue book, our passport, which we all cherish, it's more than just something you travel with. It is kind of something you are active with every day as being a member of Canada beyond, beyond our borders. Now, I hope the book sort of stimulates this, this conversation. I don't have the, uh, all the answers, but I gathered suggestions from lots of Canadians and, and think it's time, especially as we come out of this pandemic, um, uh, as, as we think about a more challenging world in the 2020s, how do we activate uh, those uh, those couple of million Canadians. You also mentioned in the book hints and whiffs of a sometimes interested but never truly committed government. Mm. And my personal story is that I sat opposite Peter Van Loan in 2011, who at the time was Minister of International Affairs. And we talked about C100, and I mentioned the Canadian expat mantra that the Canadian expat community represents the single most valuable Canadian export. And he looked across the table and in a typical Peter Van Loan fashion, very bluntly blurted out, I don't get it. C100 is nothing more than an experiment. Why has the Canadian government not jumped at the opportunity to help incubate groups like C100 or start up groups like Chambers of Commerce and business councils around the world? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a real head scratcher and it crosses parties, you know, as I write in the book, Alison Lode, who's a great Canadian, uh, global Canadian, moves back and forth now between Boston and Toronto. You know, 15 plus years ago, she prepared a document for the Privy Council office that went to, uh, I think it was Paul Martin, his, uh, his, his PMO at the time, and, um, you know, died, <laughs> died uh, there. No, no, no more words about it. Um, Christia Freeland has been talking about this for years. Uh, Jim, Jim Flaherty, may he rest in peace, was uh, enthusiastic about the C-100. So there were conservatives who got it. Uh, and I, I think some of these notions actually can be embraced by conservatives as well as liberals. Uh, there's, um, there's different ways of looking at this approach to citizenship. So the, the, I, I, and I've struggled with why we don't embrace this, especially when we look at, you know, I hold up Singapore and Israel, I talk about two very different countries, or India and Ireland uh, that have vigorous, really creative approaches to their global populations. 
uh, and uh, very democratic uh, in the cases of Israel and India. Uh, some of them offer special visas, uh, representation in government, uh, special tax status, uh, all sorts of networking opportunities uh, abroad. Um, and this has been going on for, as I document in the book, for more than 100 years by countries. Uh, the, the, the Germans and Italians invented this idea of diaspora diplomacy because they wanted to influence the uh, millions of people of, uh, who are leaving their countries to settle in New York or other parts of the world. Uh, so it's not a new concept because Canada, as a new newer country, has been much shyer to embrace it. So why? Um, I think our politicians get scared by the scandals that invariably pop up. There's um, you know, someone running around with a Canadian passport doing something bad. Uh, and we see, and, and you know, I, mean to, I don't mean to make light of it. Uh, I covered the Qatar family um, back to the 1990s. I'm aware of the abuses of the passport that go on in the world. And we have to fight that, but we don't need to give away or surrender all the opportunities because of a very small minority who abuse the privileges of a passport. There are tax dodgers. Uh, there are ne'er-do-wells or people who are just fleeing various situations here. Of course, but again, do not punish the 95% of overseas Canadians who are good citizens, uh, paying their taxes wherever they live, uh, and sometimes here in Canada, and can bring value to, to Canada. So it just takes a bit of leadership to not get spooked or sp scared by those, uh, those headline stories. I think, secondly, our bureaucracy struggles with this idea. And I've put forward uh, uh, an argument in the book that we need to appreciate that the DNA of a bureaucrat and the DNA of an expat are in some ways <laughs> antithetical. Uh, the, the, the expat is, um, you know, they're their own person. They are not an organization person. They are not a conformist. They are that misfit, uh, to quote Chamath. Uh, a bureaucrat, and, and I, I have admiration for our bureaucrats, this isn't a slight, but to be a successful bureaucrat, you have to conform. You live within a system. You try to change the system, but you live within it. And so there's a natural Venus and Mars tension there. Uh, you see that with the C-100. But the C-100 in the Valley, I devote a whole chapter to them because they are, uh, I think, a really important case study for us. Show how, And they worked with government. They worked with the consuls general over uh, successive years. They worked with a conservative government and a liberal government to help uh, Ottawa develop policies that help Canadians, not just expats. Uh, that's the tip of the iceberg of what we can do. But it took uh, some uh, careful thinking by the C-100. And as I, as I write about their history, the founders of it almost walked out the door uh, on their first couple of meetings with bureaucrats. <laughs> they thought, are you kidding me? I mean, they're, they're Silicon Valley types. They don't like government types. Uh, and they thought, this is crazy. But they took a deep breath and they, in that Canadian way, found a middle ground. And the bureaucrats, people like Stuart Beck, who, who are great visionaries, they saw kind of over the hill, over the horizon, were also able to come to that middle ground and they were able to create something special. So how do we now scale that, take the C-100 and make it the, uh, the C-1 million? We need that political leadership. We need to experiment with public policy, not something Canadians are always excited to do, especially in a minority government uh, and a politically charged environment. We need our bureau bureaucrats to come around to this. And I think they I think they, they can and they're willing. And we need Canadian leaders, business leaders, academic leaders to, to stop talking about brain drain when people leave the country and talk about brain circulation. So when people go out, they are not a loss to Canada. They create, and I argue this in the, in the book, we have to understand we live in the, the age of networks. And if you understand network dynamics, you are exponentially increasing your network with each node that you move. So if you were to move to Tokyo tomorrow, you're not a loss to Canada. You are probably adding uh, 10 more nodes to, to Canada if we connect with you. If we don't connect you with you, we go to one from one to zero. That's the binary choice. But if we maintain that connection, we go from one to 10. That's the exponential thinking. That's silic that is the DNA of Silicon Valley. But that's also the DNA of, uh, of expat networks. And, and as a country of 40 million people, I think that's an enormous opportunity because we can use those 2 million to connect us with 
100 million more people around the world. And then Canada becomes, again, a much more relevant force in uh, the world, something we're fretting about, uh, fretting about losing. You know, at the same time, there's an interesting dichotomy that's apparent in the book that you know, even under Harper, while there seemed to be little appetite in developing these communities, they were heavily reliant on the Canadian Chambers of Commerce and business councils that are located around the world to get an audience with prominent overseas Canadian business leaders. Even though they were anti-expat voter, passed anyway, even in the last election, John Baird made a point of traveling to Hong Kong to visit a conservative expat group, specifically to encourage voter participation. And, and uh, unfortunately, and I think this cuts across parties, it's, it's too often opportunistic or transactional, and it isn't strategic. And when you look at, um, you know, as I say, Israel and Singapore, China, of course, um, India, these are countries, Democrat as well as authoritarian, who think 30, 40 years out. They think about how the world will be 30 or 40 years from now and how their country could be or should be in, in that changing world. And then they start to position themselves accordingly. And there are plenty of Canadian thinkers, global thinkers who think that way, but we need to help our government, uh, whoever is in power. Um, you know, th th there's a certain amount of transaction that's required in government uh, and opportunism, opportunism that's inevitable in politics. But how do we help our governments also think strategically to think 30, 40 years out and realize, you know, Canada is going to be a much smaller place in the world. That's just the, the tra that's just basic math. Um, the world will be more networked. That's where technology is, is is going. How do we take advantage of that? You also wrote about an apparent contradiction where expats would love to see more support from government, but at the same time seem reluctant to participate in some government-led programs. And I'm guessing it's perhaps out of fear that the government will take over. But what's the solution? Yeah, you need a, um, uh, a sort of a cluster, a core of committed expats to build up uh, local local associations, local networks. And it's going to change by, by place. We shouldn't expect a, a, an expat community in uh, Guadalajara to be the same as a, uh, an expat community or function the same as one in Guangzhou, uh, nor do we, should we expect it to be the same decade after decade. Uh, so let them kind of chart their, the, their own course. Um, but respect them, listen to them. That is absolutely critical and is one of those Canadian strengths that I write about in, uh, in, in, in the book. Let them guide us and help them see that they're having influence. Because a lot of expats have felt patronized over the decades where a government, even a well-meaning government, shows up and you've probably been in these rooms, you sit down at that round table uh, there's much nodding of heads with those, you know, maple leaf flags in the middle. Uh, there's a photographer, um, hands are shaken, um, toasts are made, and then, then nothing. And if you're an expat, you're probably really successful at what you're doing, or at least you're trying to be really successful. Um, you don't need that. Uh, you're busy doing what you're doing. Uh, and you're giving your time, your energy, a bit of your, your, your brain power hoping to make a contribution to your country. And I heard over and over and over again from expats who said, I am here because of Canada. It was Chamath who said, I owe everything to Canada. I grew up in a refugee family. How many countries in the world can a refugee kid grow up you know, above a laundromat in Ottawa and end up as a scholarship student at Waterloo and then as an early executive at Facebook? That's kind of the Canadian story. Uh, and he knows that and he wants to pay back. But you can't patronize the guy because he's doing his own thing. He's still, you know, till his dying breath, he'll be charting, forging his own course. Um, so how do we sort of harness, harness that, uh, respect it, um, which is how other countries go about uh, their work with, uh, with, with, with their diasporas. They learn from them. They let them kind of take them into uh, into the world. It's going to take a different kind of uh, 
diplomatic core, frankly, than we probably had. And I think our foreign service has been evolving uh, over the decades. But, you know, we, we, we should get away from notions of a Pearsonian foreign policy. I mean, please give me a break. Um, you know, it's been 50 plus years uh, since Mr. Pearson's time. Uh, and with all due respect to to him and, and, and the great periods of foreign policy since then, the 2020s are going to be profoundly, they already are profoundly different, even from the 2000s. And therefore, the way we conduct foreign policy needs to be different. I t- try to stress in the book that we're going from an institutional age to a network age. Uh, human networks are far more powerful. Look at Black Lives Matter. That is uh, you know, just the latest example of a human network that is far more powerful than the greatest institutions on earth. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't need institutions. We do. We do need uh, government. We do need uh, foreign uh, representation through a diplomatic corps. I'm not suggesting a libertarian approach to global affairs. But with that institutional approach, we need a, a, a much more dynamic, uh, human-led network uh, approach. Uh, and you know, network theory shows you that it takes you to different places. It's, it is literally not, uh, not, not linear. Our foreign service is going to have to adjust to that, not to be replaced by it, but to be compatible with that, uh, with that network uh, approach. Do you have hope that Canada will come to recognize the value that our expats hold for Canada? I do. I do, in part because we have to. I think we should seize on our failure to win a Security Council seat as a gift to us to help get us away from a bit of that institutional mentality around our place in the world. Uh, There's nothing wrong with that campaign nor with winning that seat necessarily. But there's far, there, there are other very powerful approaches, uh, uh, particularly through expat networks, that can help build our presence in the world and advance our interests as well as our values in the world. So in a way, this is, this is the moment to seize, to seize on a new strategy. The old strategy is not working. Uh, so let's kind of put that behind us respectfully move to a new network-led, human-led approach to, uh, to Canada's position in the world. We also need to come to grips with the fact that it is a much harsher world. Surely the lessons of our run-ins with uh, China and Saudi Arabia, and we could add to the list, are a message to us that you know, being nice little Canada gets you nothing. Uh, it, that has been a very kind of sobering uh, period for us, even our relationship with the United States. And uh, this is not because of Donald Trump. It will, uh, uh, regardless of the outcome of the November election, our relations with the U.S. are going to be more challenged. It uh, doesn't mean they're not going to be positive and productive, but we're going to have to come about it, go about it in a different way. The world is just rougher and tougher. Um, and Canada is smaller and less important uh, in some ways to the rest of the world. We have to demonstrate our value to the world. And part of that demonstration is the value of our people who go out into the world. During the the, uh, free trade talks, the USMCA talks with the Trump government, one of the quiet but very effective things that the Trudeau government did was to activate networks of Canadians around the United States who are doing all sorts of incredible things in a state like Illinois or Michigan, and to say, hi, (laughs) it's Canada calling. Do you think you can help us here? Uh, You might know the governor. And they're like, yeah, I was just with the governor last weekend because I run a big company in whatever state it is, or I run a university there, or I know the senator. Um, You might want to say a thing or two about Canada. And they did. Uh, and you know what, that, that, that helps. And it's a nice little signal of how our networks can uh, help us. But it can't be just crisis response. That's not a very strategic approach to uh, expats. That's necessary, but highly insufficient. Uh, so how do we take that same spirit uh, and start to think about using those people, uh, working with those people, it's not using them, working with them to build kind of new global strategies for, uh, for, for, for Canada, because we need the world uh, 
to govern itself in certain ways, not like us. This isn't, uh, and this is another good line for the book. We don't don't go out into the world um, to tell the world how to to act or behave, but we share our experiences uh, with the world and have influence that way. And we need the world to be not like Canada, but to to hold and develop more of the values and principles that we hold true and dear in Canada, because that is necessary for our prosperity. If the world becomes less small L liberal, if it becomes more authoritarian, if it becomes more isolationist, um, we'll suffer. That's not good for Canada. So it's in our interest to to ensure that that uh, bright, uh, well-meaning, and ambitious Canadians are out there in the world doing their thing, but also helping Canada uh, uh, help the world. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. No, it's a th- thank you for uh, for all you and and your listeners are doing for uh, for Canada's place in the world. Uh, we're we're on a journey here, but uh, we got to keep moving it uh, forward together. So thank you. Planet Canada, How Our Expats Are Shaping the Future is available through Chapters Indigo or Amazon. And along with Nadia's review of the book, links are below in the description. Thanks for watching. Until next time.